Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 7, Tale of the Goat, which was fantastic for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered on November 15th, 1985. It was directed by Michael O'Harely, which who directed Junk Love, our our episode last week, which actually makes sense now that you think about it that way. Uh, that was the same guy behind the camera for both these episodes because they both suffer from the same thing, a disjointed, confusing storyline. It was written by Jim Trombetta, who he didn't really do much for my advice pretty much the only episode that he wrote he co-wrote another episode but this is the only one where he's he wrote the entire thing after this episode they're like we won't let him do that again (laughs) (laughs) no no one let him in the room again please (laughs) yes before we get started check in see what's going on each other's lives and guys it's another day it's another week it's another month and we keep getting older yeah it was my birthday, and so I'm one more year closer to my AARP membership. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking it... forward to those deals. <laughs> I, I get mail you... from them all the time. <laughs> they know I, I'm coming. I bet you you're already subscribed to the magazine. <laughs> as soon oh, as man. you saw Luke Perry on the cover, he was all over it. <laughs> it was Dan Harmon. He's the oh, one that okay. got me. <laughs> I'll do anything for Gibbs. <laughs> well, Melissa, since uh, you are the closest to actually being a member of AARP, how does it feel that all your favorite stars are now starting to grace the cover? Very sad. Very, very sad. <laughs> I was crushed when Luke Perry was on the cover because I used to love Luke Perry when I was a teenager, you know, like 12 <laughs> or 13. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. he's on the cover of AARP. By the way, he's way older than me for the record, okay? <laughs> so, way, way older than me. I was just going to let people uh, assume. Yeah, I know. <laughs> she must be like 56. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, let's get over and talk about this episode. This was this was a Tubbs classic because he's he's just solid through the entire episode because he's just laughing about voodoo the entire time and then he gets like cursed at the end. So it's just it's a Tubbs fantastic through the entire episode. <laughs> Were you gonna say Dubs? <laughs> <laughs> let's go talk about this episode. Okay, it has been a few weeks, but we have. Probably the best open of the second season. Hands down. I don't know. I actually don't know how they're going to top this this season. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was pretty fantastic. You know, we start off with Crockett picking up his brand new casket. Which of course, Crockett's caskets only fly first class. <laughs> yeah, they're at the Miami-Dade airport. Tubbs and Crockett are there. There's a uh, a casket coming in. We have to assume there's a body in there, right? Otherwise, it would be really weird that you just waiting for a brand new casket to come in uh, at the airport. But no I one tells you. Assume, but no one tells you uh, why he's I there would, waiting for it. Why were they waiting for that? They're not the coroner. Why would they be picking up a body? Uh, yeah, and I, I would just assume with how happy kind of they are because they're sitting, they're kind of walking and joking. I would assume, assume you would be much more somber if you were going to uh, look at a dead person. <laughs> yeah, I know. They were <laughs> yeah. so excited to look at this dead person. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett is giving time. A rundown that the guy inside of the casket, his name is Legba, which is perfect because he's got this limp later in the episode that his name is Leg Legba. Anyways, they're picking up Legba, and he's apparently he got hit by the Zobops, which is a gang in <laughs> Haiti that just goes around terrorizing people, and so he supposedly got hit by them, and but he's a naturalized U.S. citizen, so he's being flown back to the U.S. to be buried. Yeah, the sure. story already is is complicated, right? <laughs> right off the bat. All I know is there's a dead person in Crockett's new casket. Yep. <laughs> and you're right. And Sonny is really excited about the casket. He talks about how he's been chasing him for like three and a half years. He opens up the casket and takes a, a, like a selfie with, <laughs> Not a with, selfie. with Legba inside of the casket. <laughs> This is when we find out that it's not Legba in the casket, it's Samson. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta talk to Samson. Yeah, because the actor inside of the casket, who ends up being our main villain, his name is Clarence Williams III, who, as we just hinted at, we've also seen in Half-Baked, which is, you know, it's a fantastic comedy. But, John, it sounds like there's a whole bunch of other stuff we don't know about Clarence Williams. So he was in the original Mob 
Squad. Kind of where he started his career. He was also in the movie Purple Rain. I I know and love him from Half Baked, being played yes. Samson. He he was also in I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, another cl- instant classic. Do you think in Half Baked, in that scene where Dave Chappelle goes to talk to Samson, he's pretending to be Jamaican? Do you think he was trying to pretend like he was Tubbs? <laughs> He was I think tubs. so. That was the first thing I thought of watching this episode. Seriously. <laughs> and then a little bit for Clarence Williams' personal life. Uh, he was married to Gloria Foster, who played the Oracle from the Matrix movie. Really? They were married until he died in 2001 from the diabetes. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he's early TV because of the Mod Squad and a couple of good movies in there, especially Purple Rain. Which is an amazing movie, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what their job is, I guess, when Legba comes in, is they're supposed to make sure that the casket gets handed off to the right people. And I think what there's the reason why they're doing that is because they're going to stake out the funeral to case whoever's there. Then Crockett, like, quote, he says, quote, to see if any loose ends fall out. I'm just curious if it would have paid off because it, it might have helped later if they'd put like a mirror up to his mouth rather than take a picture. <laughs> like hold a mirror up to his mouth to make sure he's not breathing. Maybe take his pulse. I don't know. It could have saved a lot of time later on, that's for sure. It's <laughs> true. Episode over. He's yep. alive. <laughs> he's alive. There you go. <laughs> So we just jump from the airport. We're still in the open. We jump from the airport to a cemetery. And the cemetery is like shrouded in fog. And there's like this creepy music playing. And this is the trend for the whole episode, right? Anytime voodoo is mentioned, it's like this shroud of mystery and this like enchanting, creepy music that's playing. They were really trying to play on people's misunderstandings of what voodoo is is but then they never yes. address what voodoo actually is in the entire episode yes and one of the things i love too is they're trying so hard for the voodoo th- vibe and Tubbs just does not give a crap <laughs> the whole time at the funeral he's checking out hotties and <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, she not is creeping hot. Tubbs out <laughs> oh yeah, and at the airport, Tubbs was having a great time laughing about the Zobops and the Haitian voodoo, and he was he was having a great time to it. And then he goes to the funeral, and he, he looks over. And he, so Croc, for for some reason, Tubbs is like standing as part of the funeral, but Croc is hiding behind a tree. And then they're radioing <laughs> White people to aren't each allowed other. at this funeral. <laughs> so Tubbs is just standing there, and he's watching people, and he's radio. And then Sonny is radioing to him, like giving the entire backstory as if he's like narrating. It's like the director's <laughs> cut of the funeral with Sonny doing commentary on everything that's happening. And nobody can hear that, like at the funeral. No one can hear him talking. He's just right like, like the tree's yeah. right there. He's not even that, like he's the worst hide and seek player ever. You can see him right there talking into a walkie talkie. That's not distracting during a funeral at all. <laughs> so he starts to explain my like, favorite name of the episode comes driving up next and it turns out that that's his girl so mm-hmm. it's her romulus yeah yeah so first we see Tubbs. he's like making eyes at a woman her name is marie and it happens to be legba's main girl yes. and then romulus comes pulling up in his bmw <laughs> that name he, I know. The names are so hard to keep straight in this whole episode. They were so hard to keep straight. Silvio Romulus comes driving up in his BMW, (laughs) grabs Maria, and leaves in the middle of the funeral. Just after that happens, because Sonny tells Tubbs, because Sonny happens to know everything, you would think it'd be better if Sonny was at the, was actually participating in the funeral and then just narrating for everyone else that's there, because he happens to know everyone that's involved in this. Right after... Romulus leaves. A mo- a masked motorcycle man comes flying out from behind the funeral and shoots up the casket and then drives away. <laughs> so yeah, uh, now we have rival voodoo gangs. <laughs> I guess maybe, or maybe it was Romulus that ordered the hit on it and make sure that he was actually dead. Well, he did come and get Marie and pull her out of there, like right mm-hmm. before, right? Like that's kind of suspicious timing. You're not exactly mm-hmm. hiding that you tried to. I don't understand though. He was he was supposed to be dead. Why did you shoot up a casket of a dead man? <laughs> <laughs> when a simple mirror would have sufficed. Exactly. All of yes. this. <laughs> 
what's what's fantastic about this now, other than just like all the craziness that we've had so far, the mysterious cemetery, the laughing about the Zobops, the motorcycle man shooting up the the casket, is that Crockett is telling Tubbs to make sure he averts his face from Romulus when he pulls up so he doesn't get made while he's standing in the middle of the funeral. And then when the motorcycle guy drives off, both Crockett and Tubbs run up to the casket like, okay, well, all bets are off. It's okay if they know who we are. Tubbs is going to try and infiltrate this voodoo gang later in the episode after being at the funeral for the main boss holding a gun. Uh Yeah, and then he runs over and opens the casket. How are you being undercover now then? How could you still go undercover? (laughs) <laughs> see, aside from all that, when he opens the casket, we see that Samson has turned into a goat. And now I believe in voodoo. Because that's amazing. Yeah, dude, I don't know the, how they the, did it. They were doing that little dance and bam. Am I the only one that felt sorry for the goat? <laughs> he was just a poor innocent goat minding his own business so, eating some cans and they came and got him and put him in a coffin <laughs> well in true vice fashion they reuse the goat later in the episode right after they throw the casket open and they see that it's a goat inside the hive the priest or whatever is there just says zombie and then we go to the opening credits and I just want to close out this this open it's going to be really hard to top laughing about Zobots or whatever it was that the Zobops yeah, going Zobops. to a mysterious <laughs> cemetery and have a motorcycle man shoot up a casket. It's it, with people's names being Legba and Romulus and Tubbs trying to pick up women at a funeral. Like it's going to be really hard to top this open. Yes. Yeah, somehow they do. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I, you have to tell me later what episode that is. So I want I want I want to hype that up. <laughs> oh yeah, there's lo- there is an episode. Believe me. <laughs> when we come back from the credits, we have a brief stop where we see Legba's being brought back to life. He sits up and just says mercy. He just sits up with his eyes wide open, and his main doctor slash priest is just all smiles. So we know. So hold on, Legba's this is important. Alive. This is important. Not only did they change him back from the goat, but they brought him back to life. Zombie <laughs> Samson is proof that voodoo is amazing. <laughs> we go over to the precinct and Tubbs and Crockett Castillo, they're talking to like a um, specialist or, or some like toxicologist or something like that. Yeah, he's he a thinks, toxicologist. That's what he is. Yeah. Yeah. And he thinks that Legba is alive. Crockett and Tubbs are having a fantastic time laughing about all the weird voodoo stuff they just they they are beside themselves they are laughing the entire scene beaker that's what i'm gonna call the toxicologist because he kind of looks like beaker from the muppets <laughs> <laughs> he, sa- he says that there's a toxin called terra toxin it comes from a caribbean fish that causes death by paralysis but if you survive 48 hours it's pretty much like nothing happened so that's <laughs> you're okay that's, that's kind of special <laughs> yeah after patting each other on the back and having it some big laughs after all of that stuff they decide that what they're going to do is they're going to go talk to romulus to find out what's happening and do some deeper investigation i mean they are vice cops and they should probably investigate why someone on a motorcycle shot a casket and now that the body is missing even though they're having such a great time they should probably go and investigate this we go over to romulus's house and the duo are camped outside in the ferrari romulus's house is busy with activity there's all kinds of people like packing stuff up and uh people with guns walking around. We we overhear a conversation between Romulus and Marie, where Romulus says he was left in charge, but Marie says he was just supposed to run the business, not totally take it over. And then we see Marie leave on her own, and Romulus takes off in his BMW with his guards. The duo says it's an interesting change that Marie doesn't want any part of this, but we're not interested in her. We're going to follow Romulus. Well, yeah, she says he's gonna. he has eyes in the back of his head. So she's saying that she's afraid of Legba, mm-hmm. and that's why she doesn't want to go with Romulus. The duo follows Romulus over to a car dealership, and at the at the dealership, they're filming a commercial. And the cars are great in the commercial because <laughs> one of them says hot and sassy on yeah. it, and then the other one says French and sexy. <laughs> Because everyone wants a hot and sassy car. <laughs> the guy who's in the commercial, his name is Bobby Profile. And at the end of the filming, he just like, all right, that's it. We're done. And then he 
he sees Romulus to shake hands. They go into the office, and through the giant plate glass window, you can see Bobby open a safe, hand Romulus a briefcase. Romulus opens it. Pat's like he's counting the number of wads of cash that are inside the briefcase and then walks out. First, I want to point out, I love the sus- the plaid suspender pants. <laughs> These guys, fantastic fashion. But Bobby Profile was played by Raymond Sharkley Jr. And I guess around this time, he was pretty much making the rounds and just about everything from All in the Family, Barney Miller. But our Vice connection happens to be he had a reoccurring role on Crime Story with Dennis Farino. Of course, there's always like that deep Michael Mann tie, right? Yeah. Yep. So he was also, his final TV appearance was on Jake and the Fat Man, but he also was in the movies Paradise Alley, Wise Guys, with his final film being mm. Cop and a Half. I'm sorry, so, that's a terrible movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he ended his career on, was Cop and a Half. So, but he battled drug addiction as for adult life, and in 87 was diagnosed with AIDS, and then uh, ended up dying in 1993 of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, not without some controversy. Well, yeah, that's a quick, that's a quick change from being in a whole bunch of TV to, I mean, from the time that this episode aired, it's only eight years later and he's dead. What the duo was seeing at this dealership with Romulus is it, it's clear that Romulus is going around and making some like last minute collections. Either he's afraid that L- Legba, I was going to call him Legolas. I was too. I'm like, in my head, I was like, Legolas? <laughs> zombie Samson. We know who Zombie Samson is. <laughs> he's he's either afraid that he's going to go collect or he's going to try and run away. That Romulus is going to try and take all this cash and then run off. We have our next scene is really, really interesting. We go to like, what was it like a camp? Like a homeless camp? Maybe uh, I don't know where this is. There's like some camp, and the leg was limping around. He goes over to see someone. He like pulls this guy out of like his cave. Maybe let's <laughs> <Maybe. laughs> <laughs> just be like the whole entire commentary of this part. Maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> Then Legba goes into this long rant about breaking the barrier and walking among the living again. Then he hands the person a pick, just a regular old pickaxe, and says he can do some work for him. His name's Baron Sam- Samdi? Samedi? And he calls him the master of the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure everything Legba says in this episode is just gibberish. Like he hey, didn't have master actual... of the graveyard is a heck of a promotion from guy who digs hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we end the scene with like some sort of voodoo seance where there's there's everyone's dancing around these fires, and then Legba pulls out a picture of Romulus and Marie together. He says that he's got bad loas. He holds the picture up of Romulus and says, "I cast a death spell," and then. The voodoo music ends and the fog clears and we're back to normal. <laughs> right back to normal. But is there any, you said a voodoo seance. Is there any kind of other seances? Like, am I missing something? Is there like uh, <laughs> other religions that do seances? Uh, <laughs> Wick, I'm pretty sure Wiccan do. Oh, that's true. Yep. <laughs> John with the obscure religion reference. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, don't bring me and my sisters into this. <laughs> we go back to the duo tailing Romulus, and he's still making his last minute collections. He's going over to Frank Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> The names. Because <laughs> that's the name over the door that they walk into is Frank Pizza. <laughs> wow. You know, Frank Pizza, Bobby Profile. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> Romulus. Let's not let him write any more full episodes. <laughs> or just, he can't name anybody ever again, right? Like, you can write the episode all yes. you want, but you have to give the naming to somebody else. <laughs> well, it's a good question. Like, is the person inside is his name? <laughs> Is his name Frank Pizza? Or is this supposed to be Frank's Pizza? Once Romulus goes inside Frank Pizza, <laughs> it's a set, it's a, it's a Legba setup. And so the two guards that are with Romulus, they get 
killed, one by the pickaxe, and then one by a saber, which I love this game. They have the best collection of weapons <laughs> ever. <laughs> one of them has a plunger. <laughs> because then Legba grabs Romulus and chokes him with a piano wire. So in this scene, someone gets killed by a pickaxe, a pirate sword, and piano wire. <laughs> So, like, where were they when they were planning this, that all this was available? Maybe they're just really resourceful. Like, they're just reusing what they have. They don't have money to buy guns, so I've got a lot of piano wire. I don't know why. But I have a lot of pianos with no tuning. I don't know. Outside, the duo are like totally oblivious to what's happening inside. They're, like, barely staying awake, and then they see... <laughs> The two guards for Legba come out, and then Legba himself come limping out. Crockett just throws on the lights and hits the gas and just drives up, almost hits one person who jumps out and jumps out of the way. And then they just stop and kind of stare around, confused. It's not like Legba was going to run away. <laughs> what do you mean, limp away? <laughs> and the way he limps, he's like yeah, all hunched over. Like, it's like the <laughs> zombie I don't know. Samson looks like he needs a bacchiotomy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a legionomy, actually, not a backionomy. I'm going to keep quoting half big all episode. <laughs> we go to the precinct, and this is just a quick scene. Crockett's explaining to Castillo what was happening. Crockett's like really starting to buy into the voodoo stuff, but Tubbs is still just laughing at all. I'm like, I don't know, this is it, all hilarious. And I believe that Crockett's superstitious. That makes sense. You know, <laughs> this is a guy with alligator who lives on a boat. Like, yeah. He's superstitious. <laughs> that makes sense. Castillo says, just watch Profile for the next 24 hours, or Bobby, whatever you want to call him, because it's weird to call him Profile. Uh, and then Tail Marie, and just check in on her. So, of course, what do the duo do? They go straight to Marie. <laughs> Tubbs was driving that day. <laughs> <laughs> She's packing up. She's like, preparing to run off or something i don't know she's like packing up a suitcase and the duo are, are, are inside of the house it's actually romulus's house and i guess marie was was living with him she's sticking to so, her guns raise, raise your hand if you think that the duo is gonna get marie killed later in the episode <laughs> for the record it's just one of them not the duo <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry one of them wasn't invited yep <laughs> Murray there sticks are no to trees for him to hide behind. <laughs> <laughs> Marie's sticking to the. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't know what's going on with the gang or anything. And then Tubbs like kneels down and looks around the eyes and says, "Is that because you don't want to know?" And then she caves in and says, "You better act quick." Legba's planning to go back to Haiti. He only came back for the money that Romulus owed him, and that's what Romulus had told her. Tubbs and Crockett kind of go, "Okay, cool," and they just leave. It's like, you know, <laughs> they just walk out and then Legba comes out of the shadows he was like listening the entire time I don't, I don't know he's like in the kitchen or something apparently Tubbs and Crockett didn't really look around that well inside of the house he comes out and tells Marie she's coming back with him to Haiti she just kind of rushes him off and walks away but we see now that that's what his plan is his last step that he's going to do is take her back with him to Haiti then, John, I have a feeling that this is going to be one of your favorite scenes for the staff at the vice office. We go over to the precinct, and Crockett's staying late. He's looking over the evidence. You can see he's kind of hinting at he's starting to believe in this voodoo stuff, like there's something up with it. And Pepe is sweeping the floors in the background. They're the only two that, that are there. And then Crockett leans over to Pepe, and he's like, hey, you mind come take a look at this? Like, he just needs extra eyes on the... Maybe Pepe might catch something that he doesn't see. Pepe walks over and asks him, do you believe in the ocean? And then the creepy music starts to play. Oh, like fog machine turns on. <laughs> and Pepe says, no matter if you do or don't, if you step in it, you're going to get wet. <laughs> Life lessons. <laughs> so. <laughs> Profound. Yeah, and I love how Crockett's taking advice from a janitor. Yeah, he's I made mean, the best decisions in his life. That's what I say. Like, I would have trusted a janitor with police work. Like, isn't that stuff like confidential? Or, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Not only that, but just because he has a, an accent doesn't mean he knows anything about voodoo. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
the phone rings and breaks the uncomfortable silence. And it's Marie. <laughs> she says that she doesn't that, that she wants to be safe. She doesn't want to go with Legba back to Haiti. Crocker Kro- Kro- says he'll come get her. But we see in the background that Baron is watching in on the phone call. We have a really fast scene after this phone call. By and the way, Le- I miss Payfa. There have yes. been about half a dozen times where I could have really used the payphone. I mean, uh, uh, I, uh, there's like a, a few times in the last couple of years where I really needed to go to the bathroom, but there was nowhere to go, and I really missed the payphone. <laughs> 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 we have a quick scene at Leg Buzz where he's just wa- he's randomly watching a commercial for Bobby Profiles car lot, and he pulls out an AK and shoots the TV. So we get the messaging like he's going to go kill Bobby next. But interesting, he's just sitting there watching car commercials. He just He's just sat there for hours waiting for that commercial to come on. <laughs> I hate car commercials. Maybe he doesn't even know Bobby. He just doesn't like car commercials. You know what's probably the worst thing for Legba in this scenario is that he waited hours and hours because there's no DVR. So he waited hours and hours for that commercial to finally come on. He shoots the TV all seriously and then there was no one around to see it. <laughs> so then he had to like go get into the mm-hmm. TV and set it back up, tell his guys to come sit with them. That way they can see this tension, high tension moment. The next morning at the dealership, Bobby sees that there's some graffiti on. Oh, sorry, it's a um, it's not a graffiti on on one one of his vans. It's one of Legba's vans that's parked out in front, right, or whatever it is. There's graffiti on one of the vehicles out in the lot. Then he hears that he's on a phone call, so Bobby goes in. He p- picks up the phone. It's Legba. Legba asks him if he got the message and that he wants. The five hundred thousand dollars that Romulus owes him. Outside, Crockett and Tubbs and the B team are listening in in the bug van, which means that at some point in time, they put a ta- they, they wiretapped his phone. I guess we just didn't get to see that, or they put a microphone inside inside of the office or something. Yeah, I guess. I mean, that could have been a for- an important scene. You know, maybe yes. more important than uh, Zombie Samson shooting the TV. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Profile, the ultimate salesman, says I can't use guns, by the way. This is way (laughs) off. The ultimate salesman says, like, your money's out here. I've invested all that money. You come down here, sign some paperwork. I'll make sure all the investments have been turned over to you. Legba says, all my my signature is what I did to Romulus. I'm going to come down and give you my signature and then hangs up the phone. And then Bobby goes into this long rant of giving like all the exact <laughs> things that he's going to do. It's like, we're going to get like about to meet us over on I-91 at the construction site and we're going to kill him with three bullets <laughs> 37 feet away from the shore of the river. Like he just gives out everything exactly the time of day, the direction the sun will be in, how high it is off the horizon, the bus schedule on how to get there <laughs> i mean it is convenient right because people were listening in he was giving him like the blueprint to how to get to see what he was going to do <laughs> even more confusing is then after he does that we just fast forward to that night and bobby's still there all by himself at the dealership and three of leg buzz men just come in they open up a briefcase and they hold bobby at bomb point i guess you could call it bomb point. <laughs> yeah Oh, my question is, why not run? Question number two. Did, did did the vice cops get enough recording that they just drove away? Yeah. Shouldn't they, they still back? be there watching? <laughs> I thought they were staking the place out. Did they go out to dinner? Is this how this happens? <laughs> there are so many questions from this scene because two men just run in and open up the safe and pull and start pulling out money. Like, what use is a safe if you if it you could just open it? If you don't lock it, it's not necessarily a safe. Okay, <laughs> it's just a box with an open door. <laughs> not just that, but like they open up the bomb and like they just stand around waiting for the bomb to go off. And then that's the next question. It's like, then what happened? You see two people run outside, but you don't see Bobby or the person who's carrying the bomb. They all of a sudden, you just see the dealership blow up. So who was still in there? Who died? Did anyone die? Did all of them die? What I happened? don't know. What happened to the safe? Who gets his cars? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a lot of Cadillac left on that lot. Someone's, someone's the money. Maybe it was the guy who was bitching too earlier. <laughs> we go from that fantastic scene to another fan- short but fantastic scene where we're on Crockett's boat. And Gina is babysitting Marie and she's like, Oh, hi, Marie. So, what's all this voodoo stuff about? <laughs> she pulls out her Calvin like- Klein model, jumps out of nowhere, and tries <laughs> to kill him. <laughs> yeah, why was. 
was he in his, because he was in the water so he was just in his yeah. underwear that didn't look like swim trunks those just look like underwear for the record he clearly could wear afford more to buy swim speedos trunks if i was a hitman <laughs> If I was actively trying to kill someone, I would bring more than Speedos. I would want to have pockets. Maybe it's because he was, like, slippery, so you can't catch him. He's too slick. She tries to get him down, but she can't get him because he's too slippery. He's all wet. (laughs) His underwear, (laughs) jumping around everywhere. He looked fantastic, but he just (laughs) sucks at his job. Oh, he was in shape, that's for sure, but yeah. (laughs) Marie does give some information that means absolutely nothing in the rest of the episode. She says it's called the Grand Sanctuary, that their O'Cores and their voodoo is like black magic, and that people come from all over to, to go to their rituals. All this information means nothing in the episode. And then we have my favorite meeting with the uh, Vice team. Basically, Tubbs is pitching them going undercover, and Tubbs is sold in and- Trudy is not. And, no. And it's clear, clearly they're the only two options to go undercover. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For some reason. So, but Tubbs is so like, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to walk in there. They're going to give me what I want. I'll even give you a French accent instead of a Jamaican accent. <laughs> well, in the end, he does the Jamaican, though, right? <laughs> it always no, goes he tries back. the French, the poor le vu. And... Well, that's the... what that was supposed to be. <laughs> that was supposed to be French. That, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just Jamaican with a flair. Like... <laughs> no. <laughs> this the scene has a bunch of great stuff in it. And just to recap, Marie tries to run away after the attack. Gina fights them off, but Marie gets captured. Here we are at the precinct. They're going to decide what they're going to do. Tubbs says he'll go undercover. He'll try and infiltrate the Grand Sanctuary, the event where the, the big voodoo event that Legba's going to have before he goes back to Haiti. Cassio says, just get the girl. Don't try and don't bother with Legba. Crockett is adamant that they can't take Leba lightly. They they need to be focused on this. And the ladies say, we got other stuff to do. We're on loan with so- someone else tomorrow, so you're going to have zero backup. And Tubbs is like, these people are <laughs> lame. I got this. You don't need no backup. Everything's good. So, so the next day, when when they go to when Tubbs goes to infiltrate Grand Sanctuary, he goes and stands on the street corner where there's supposed to be a pickup. Like that's where they're gonna do the pickup. And Sonny comes driving up, and then Tubbs says, after all that stuff, he's like, nah, I got this. This is easy. They're a bunch of chumps. He says, No, I'm nervous about not having any backup, and it would be cool like if if we didn't have to go this deep undercover with this with this crazy of gang. Uh, well, why did you volunteer? <laughs> and Crockett told him like this is uh, a terrible uh, idea. No, you shouldn't do this. No, they're dangerous. So you can't I, do it. So I also want to point out in the meeting in the last scene, Crockett was saying how I think it was Tubbs that was saying that voodoo is just something that only poor people and believe and that uh, like uneducated people uh, too, right? Poor and yeah, like uneducated, uneducated it, poor and uneducated people. In the scene, we see a bunch of really beat up chucks and people grinding in the beds with tarps mm-hmm. over these chucks. And here's Crockett and his black Ferrari. Obviously, he chose the black one for surveillance because that won't uh, stick out. <laughs> but yeah, and then after he talks to Tubbs, he just goes and parks it right across the street. You've got like beat up truck, not working truck, and then you've got mm-hmm. Ferrari. <laughs> not only is he trying to do the French accent, which is just terrible, but then he tries to bribe the guy with like a dollar. <laughs> What can Mr. Washington get me? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Le Vu. <laughs> but yeah, he bribes his way to the back of the truck, and then when he's getting in there, he plants a tracking device right in the middle of the bumper on the back of the truck as if no one would see that. And then we have a great montage. We have a following montage. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very good following, though. But, but <laughs> no, first impression is that so the truck takes off and Crockett's going to follow. And I love tracking devices in the 80s because it's literally the hot and cold game. It beeps faster for uh-huh. hot, slower for cold. Good luck following this truck. <laughs> Yeah, and it looks like a garage door opener with the, and it always has the red light that's blinking. You because know? that's and what it, it is. Ugh. They didn't have the budget to get anything better than that. Think about last week where they had that gigantic remote for that bomb. <laughs> 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 they don't have very good. I just technical wonder which uh, which guy on the staff had to sacrifice his garage door opener. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your garage door opener. Damn it! <laughs> of course, Crockett loses him. The the tracking device fell off somewhere, and so now Tubbs is literally on his own. And we go to 
what is the best most fantastic tub Fact, scene in the are history than ferraris <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly <Yeah. laughs> so i don't know how tubs is ever going to be able to top this next scene we go to grand this is like a bangles he... video <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I told you, Dominic, about this scene <laughs> beforehand. I said, this scene, there's going to be a scene at the end where Tubbs is going to do some freaky ass crap. <laughs> like, you're never going to believe that with his acting in this scene. I told you. I tried to warn you. <laughs> so we, we come in and music's playing. And, and, and then, like, there's just like a seance going around the fire, right? And then all of a sudden, Tubbs has like some sort like of... like Egyptians, I believe. <laughs> Then all of a sudden, Tubbs has like some sort of muscle spasm or a seizure. No, that or was dancing. That was his way of dancing. See, I thought he was on acid. Okay. In reality, all he does is run over, grab Marie, and then try and run off. Like, but sees what's happening. And because Tubbs he's gets not about, blind. No. And he, Tubbs gets about 10 feet away, trips and falls. <laughs> And then, and then Why everyone did he has him at fall? gunpoint. Why did know. he? I thought at that point they had already drugged him. I'm like, oh, so they've already drugged him. That's why he's dancing so what like I'm that. Curious about. And then he trips on his own feet. <laughs> oh no, Tubbs has been drugged. Nope, that's just the way he dances. <laughs> and like, I, I couldn't figure out watching it when they drugged him. And so I'm thinking, like, didn't he listen to the guy talk about the poison fish? Why would you eat fish at a seance anyway? Before we get to the like the real best part, we have just a brief <laughs> scene with Crockett where he's still trying to figure out where Tubbs is. They think they saw the truck heading out to Kendall Estates. He still can't find him. We go back to the sanctuary and we walk in and Tubbs is being brought into like some crisscross applesauce meeting, maybe. I, I duck, think they're duck, playing goose. Yeah, they're playing like duck duck goose or something. <laughs> Everyone's sitting in a circle holding candles, leg bus sitting in a giant wicker chair. And John now that I think about it, this is a lot like that scene in Half Baked where Samson sit at the end where Samson's sitting on the throne and then Chappelle comes in pretending to be Jamaican. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Le Legba talks like he had some sort of stroke or something. Like, he's got mental problems. He's just not making he's any sense. He's a zombie, man. You gotta give him a break. <laughs> they force Tubbs to his knees, and then they inject him with something and says that the dose might kill him. And then there's this long, weird rant by Legba that ends with, quote, if you survive, the only law you will obey is of the walking dead. So and what I took from this is that they gave him the yep. <laughs> <laughs> Is that accurate? Is that a good way to put it? <laughs> so I'm going to try and describe now. After There's Tubbs, no way to describe it. Without, after with Tubbs gets injected with this, what what he looks like. Stage one, he looks like he's really cold. Like he needs a jacket. He's shivering. And then, then, then he starts to shake a little bit more. And he goes cross-eyed like that scene where Noogie's getting married to his wife, to a stripper wife. He kind of looks like, like he's having like that kind of seizure. <laughs> In a daze, he sees that Legba kills Marie, but he's got his back blocking what's happening. And then you go back to start to get sweaty. So look, he, he's gotten to stage two where it's like the spiciness of the <laughs> of the injection is starting to kick in, and it's like a it's something uh, uh, really spicy. Someone needs to get him a glass of milk. I was really hoping we we're gonna turn Tubbs into a goat too. <laughs> <laughs> he just turned into a goat right in front of you. And then the pain. Well, they can really... turn him back. They they did it once in the episode. <laughs> And then the pain Imagine. really ramps up, and it goes to leg cramp tubs. <laughs> he's Foot shaking. Cramp. Okay. Yeah, he's shaking. Someone needs to get him a banana. He's got <laughs> serious calf problems that's happening. And then it ends with where he's finally going to pass that kidney stone that he's got. And it's like finally making it out to the end, and then he passes out. Tubbs' acting was fantastic. I totally got everything he was going for. The kidney stone, the leg cramps. <laughs> <laughs> the spicy food. I got it all. <laughs> now we've got Detective Crockett the next day searching for his buddy. And I love the concern when he finds, you know, Tubbs' lucky jacket. Lucky <laughs> jacket. <laughs> <laughs> oh my no. god <laughs> Poor yeah. Tubbs. And, and then zito finds Tubbs <laughs> in the pool in the empty pool right and instead of him hopping down into the pool he just yells out crockett 
here's Tubbs. Crockett comes running over, jumps into the pool, and tells Zito to go call an ambulance. Like, because Zito what? don't care. <laughs> he is not Switek, so he don't care. Okay, <laughs> it's not his partner. He doesn't care. Uh, <laughs> All those yeah, Jesus jokes. is still in the van. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All those jokes they make about them, the B team, how they're always making jokes about Zito and Switek. Nah, he's uh, not gonna uh, go save you in the pool. <laughs> he's gonna let you lay there. I love how no one checks to see if anyone's ever dead. I know. No. <laughs> He just yells out, hey, Crockett, I found something. We get to the next scene. It's at the hospital, and Tubbs is still alive. He's, like, having a really bad hangover. Sweat. Special medicine is not working, and so they have to get a witch. <laughs> well, the toxicologist from, from the beginning of the episode, the beaker is back. He injects Tubbs with, like, the, whatever the He's cure like, I is. He's that fish. <laughs> And mostly, you you notice something right away in this scene with Tubbs. This, this is a questionable hospital. Yeah, okay. There's no... He has nothing attached to him. Wasn't he, like, dead, like, hours ago? <laughs> like, laying in a pool face down? There's no, th there's no monitor on him. There's no IVs. It's just some guy in a hospital who <laughs> pretends to put a, a needle in his arm, and then miraculously he wakes up. Like, why did they wait so long to give him that medicine? Why didn't they give it to him right away? What was like, Why did everyone have to be in the room while they did it? They took him to a vet. <laughs> I just said I told Dominic that maybe they didn't have the money to get like the budget for Miami Vice was like slim so I'm like maybe they didn't have the money so it's like in the back of some guy's office they set up a bed you know in like the the writer's office and they're like just put a bed in there it'd be fine no one will notice he's not being monitored or those no nurses or doctors in this hospital what? broom closet 2 is also yeah, exactly. hospital room 221A yeah exactly <laughs> while Tubbs is laying in the bed he's having like flashbacks from what was happening the night before he sees himself being injected he sees marie get killed marie starts talking to him in the hallucinations too saying and eventually marty's mustache brings tubs <laughs> out of his days it is a mighty fine mustache that is <laughs> and then tubs just lunges for crockett's throat maybe he was mad because he lost him <laughs> <laughs> This is all your fault. <laughs> Crockett calms him down and Tubbs starts crying. Says that Legba killed Marie. Mostly you were saying that like he lunged for Crockett's throat and no one did anything. They just watched Marty it just happen. watched. And he was like, yep. Just sitting there like, yeah, that's what I would do too. They'll work this out. Don't worry about it. It was expected. <laughs> yeah. He's like, they'll work do this, this out. this every Tuesday. These crazy boys. I'll just let them <laughs> choke it out. It'll be okay. He doesn't even help him. What if he did strangle Crockett? He doesn't help him at all. <laughs> and then he, and then when um, Tub starts crying, did you notice that Marty like shakes his head like in disappointment? He's like, yeah. Shh, whatever. <laughs> You're what such a hell? wimp. Such a wimp. Just because you got drugged and got all sweaty in a seance. <laughs> so I love how right after he's basically dead, he basically talks his way somehow not only back into the office, but back into the action plan mm -hmm. of going after zombie Sans Samson. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marty's like, no, I don't think you should go out. I don't think it's a good idea. He's not in the right state of mind. And Crocker's like, eh, he'll be fine. <laughs> he's fine don't worry i mean he did try to strangle me like an hour ago but mm -hmm. he seems okay to me that's pretty normal and crocus seems to know an awful lot of information because when he heard blackbird barty asked him what is that and crocus says it's a haitian freighter yeah and that stop at the precinct that we have before the final scene marty says say this one tubs out there crocus says he's going to be okay he's just a little rattled <laughs> the b team is already out at the blackbird freighter and that's where we're going to go for the final scene when we get there leg was van is being lifted onto the boat the b team are in disguise they're walking around as if they're uh, the teamsters working around the boat tubs and crockett so, are hiding in the shadows it, it is very unfortunate timing while they're ducking around in the shadows there's like a drive-by like next door or something because <laughs> all of a sudden there, there's gunshots <laughs> And everyone just kind of pops out, like, who shot at who? Because you see Baron up on the boat. He's hiding, but he doesn't <laughs> Sorry. shoot. Sorry. He doesn't. <laughs> how, could you, how could you see him? He hides so well. I mean, <laughs> So yeah, John, the shooting just comes out of nowhere. It, uh, no one from Legba's team shot. The duo didn't shoot anyone. It's just random shooting all of a sudden happened. Tubbs is still so out of it. car backfired and caused, like, this big <laughs> shootout because of it. It was yeah. the goat. Poor the timing. goat started it all. <laughs> <laughs> the goat finally got his revenge. Tubbs, of course, he's still rattled, so he looks off the wrong way. He like, <laughs> aims his gun at the, in the wrong direction. Crockett flips around, shoots and kills Baron, and just starts popping people off left and right. Killed so many people that scene. <laughs> While Tubbs oh, yeah. was pointing his gun the wrong direction and like going cross-eyed yeah, again. Uh, 
Yes. As soon as gunfire starts happening, you know, it's like murder spree. <laughs> Nick so, jumps out of the van and he starts limping away like he's got a really bad Charlie horse or something. <laughs> He had such a bad cramp. <laughs> and Tubbs I was just thinking after. all the time, brains. I need brains. <laughs> so Tubbs takes off after him, and he can't shoot. He's he's having, he's like Got he's he's seeing things wrong. He's like he he he's, he's like imagining where Legby is, but he disappears. So he's like you can see he's still having trouble. He eventually runs down Legby and fires off a shot, hitting him right in his gimpy leg. <laughs> He corners him up on top of the boat. Sonny's still dropping fools left and right. And Legba just starts yelling out to Tubbs, Voodoo Legba and walk inside me. And Tubbs starts having like these visions and flashbacks that was happening from when he was drugged. And we and we didn't mention that like the part of the drugging that Legba was saying is like it'll make it so you can't be a cop anymore. You'll only like basically you'll only listen to me, but you won't be able to do your job anymore. You gave him the yeah. <laughs> I, I'm more interested in the fact that Tubbs finally battles through the yips, shoots him, <laughs> but I don't think he actually hits him because clearly Zombie Samson jumps off of the ship in the next yes, scene. He jumps. He clearly he's not, jumped he, off. He's not falling. Yeah, you can see him like his body is like ready to jump into the water. I, that's why I said like, are they sure he's dead? Because he jumped into the water. Well, once again, we don't check. We don't check to make sure people's dead. Especially a man who's already been dead in the episode earlier. Lake Bob eventually pulls out a gun. He shoots and misses. And you're right. Like, it doesn't look like he hits him. Lake Bob just jumps off into the water. We don't see what happens to him. And then Tums eventually realizes, like, oh, wait, I didn't actually see Marie get killed. He runs over to the van. Pulls open like a hidden com- a hidden casket inside of the van. And in there is Marie still alive. And then we freeze frame on the end of the episode. And that's it. Oh, but you know Tubbs got his groove back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking when they opened that van up and they lifted up that um, casket thing. I'm like, what kind of freaky crap was he into? <laughs> like, this is some weird stuff. What was going on in this van? Was he picking up women and having sex with them in that vault thing? And that is casket? that just the way he travels? Does he just travel via coffin? This episode just like it's the same as last week. They're just rusty ending so fast. We have so many questions left over, but I need to mute myself. So let's get over to the music so I can finish laughing about the yips while John while John talks about the music. Okay, John, I looked at the music list and I did recognize one band in Red Rider, but All right. So our first song is Phantom Living by the Fit. So they were a rock new wave band out of London that came together in 1979. It was founded by college friends Cy Curran on vocals and Adam Woods on drums. The group was initially called The Portraits. They released a couple singles and then changed their name to The Fix with one F with one X in 1980 but after playing club scene the club scene they got a record deal in 1982 from MCA but MCA made them adjust their name because they were worried people would connect fix with drugs mm. so they became the fix with two X's <laughs> that makes it better that's a thousand times better so pretty much from what I could tell the fix was just kind of a new wave rock band that they had a bunch of different songs. They did pretty well for themselves. I didn't recognize a single damn song that they had. I'm so sure I would move on to, <laughs> to someone you might actually recognize. And that would be our next song is Transformation by Nona Hendrick. Nona Hendrix, you might not recognize her name, but she was known for being one third of the band LaBelle or basically Patti LaBelle's group. Their big hit being the song Lady Marmalade. In 1944, Nona Hendrix met Jer- New Jersey native Sarah Dash. And a little bit later that year, Philadelphia born Patricia Holt, a.k.a. Patti LaBelle. So after a short-lived 10 year with Del Capri's, they formed, the three of them formed the girl group, the Ordettes. They would tour around as the Ordettes and eventually add another member, fourth member, Cindy Birdsong in 1961 and change their name to the Bluebells. And that is when they would sign their first record contract. It was pretty much at that point, Patti LaBelle took the front stage. That's when their music started to get kind of popular. In 1967, though, Birdsong would leave for their rival, The Supremes. 
and they would find themselves in between record deals, basically looking for a resurgence because so to try and revitalize their career, they would move to England. And that is when they would become the LaBelles. And that is when they would have their hit Lady Marlowe. And that is really when Patti LaBelle just continued, Nona Hendrix continued to be in the shadow kind of, of Patti LaBelle. So she would go in about 1977 and release her first solo record. But that would actually do poorly and she would actually lose her record deal because of it. So coming into the 80s, she was doing backup vocals for the band The Talking Heads before she put she put together and fronted rock group Duro Cool. Throughout the 80s, she would release a second solo album after seeing some success with Zero Cool, and that is where we get the song Transformation, which is the one in the episode. And that is based on her second solo album, 1983's Nona. So it actually turned out to be a big dance hit, and ironic enough, later on, it would be covered by Patti LaBelle. Weird. <laughs> yes. That actually, she would actually, she actually continues to perform all the way up to as recently as, I want to say 2014 or 13. But she was also, her biggest success would eventually be in 1987's Why Should I Cry, which actually landed her in the top five in R&B. But she also, in the 80s, did a number of soundtracks, including this song, Transformation, for the soundtrack to the movie Perfect, and the song Transparent for the movie Coming to America. Our next song is Can't Turn Back by Red Rider, which is the Canadian band who we've mm-hmm. already talked about for the song Lunatic, Lunatic Fringe. And this is like worse timing because I don't, the last thing I need is another Red Rider hole to go down. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Trying to figure out something new to talk about. This was off of their album Neruda in 1983 and was written by Tom Cochran, who was the lead singer. So a little bit about Tom Cochran is he's from Lynn Lake, Manitoba. He bought his first guitar when he was 11 by selling his toy train. (laughs) (laughs) Toy train from an 11 year old. Like, that just screams I scam know. to me. <laughs> Dude, you know, who... That can only happen in Canada and not to end in a police report. Yeah, I was going to say, like, and who trusts that? Like, that sounds kind of shady. <laughs> Oh, That's not creepy so at all. He would. He tried to. Ma- he made his way to L.A. and got a job writing theme music for the movie "My Sure Is My Business," which I thought was a porn, but it turned out to be the Xavier Holander story. So it's a Canadian porn. Yes. So he would return to Toronto, all broken, disenfranchised, after L.A. didn't work out. <laughs> Driving a cab and even worked at, at on a cruise ship part time until one day at the El Macabo Tavern in Toronto, he would meet Red Ryder in, 19, in 1978, and then he would for ten plus years as their lead singer. What a weird coincidence! Sometimes going back to Canada is what will make you famous, folks. <laughs> Very rarely, but sometimes. So the last song we have is Todd Rundgren. It's the song Flesh. Song Flesh off his 81 album Healing. Todd Rundgren is a musician who in the 1970s and 80s engineered and produced albums and like Grand Funk Railroad, The New York Dolls, All mm-hmm. Notes, and including being credited for Meat Loaf's Bat Out of Hell. He's best known for his 1972 album, his gold record, Something anything features the songs hello it's me and i saw the light you know it doesn't matter what he did nothing will ever top being that close to hall's mustache (laughs) yes yes tom rungren basically is just like from what i was reading basically he was a studio guy and a studio artist who played on everybody's tracks. When they came out with music videos, he was intrigued. So he was one of the first guys who would do like animation for music mm. videos. So he released some stuff himself, but he was always known for just being a really good musician. He would fill in for people on tours. Like in 2005, he joined the new Cars, which is basically the Cars. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> there was this short-lived band called Utopia or short-lived project because it was kind of like a Wizard of Oz rock show that just sounded like a cluster and that it probably <laughs> lost tons of money. <laughs> yeah, so he was pretty much he was just a studio guy that had uh, just a really really good studio guy. And that is your music. Let's let's get over to our final thoughts on this uh John because I know you had to dig deep for that music and I don't want a case of the yips to kick up again <laughs> cuz this was this was a an obscure music segment except for Red Rider who but we've had them before so I know you really had to dig deep for this music segment all right let's go over and talk about our final thoughts on this episode all right, Melissa, I am going to pick on you this week. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> well, my you know, final thoughts are that it's very, it's a very entertaining episode, I guess, <laughs> in some way. I don't know. <laughs> I know that you were dreading this episode when you saw it on the list that this one was coming up, that you're not a fan of this episode, although the, the next one you are a gigantic fan of. Oh, I am so excited for the next episode. I can't wait. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not a fan of this episode. I don't like Clarence at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I don't know. I don't. I really don't have anything nice to say about that whole thing. <laughs> but um, I, I said, except I like I said, you get the gem of Tubbs acting at the end. <laughs> I mean, I, I shouldn't say the acting. The writing must have been stellar. And so he was just, oh, yes. he was just fulfilling what they put on the paper. He had to bring it <laughs> to, to flourish in, in the screen. Okay, so he just had to. <laughs> it just looked like he was having a seizure. I mean, that's what it was supposed to. Or like you said, he had a really bad cramp. Or I don't know. Maybe he had to hold in a fart, and it was just too. I don't know. <laughs> he was gonna let it slip. <laughs> Well, I would say I knew going into it that it was going to be an awkward e episode because of the voodoo aspect and any, it's not just my advice, any TV show in the 80s, it seems like they all had like a Santeria or a voodoo episode at some point in time and all of them were terrible. None of them were ever any good, but I'll give credit to Vice on this one is that it was a lot of fun. They did a lot of really goofy stuff and it's, it feels like some of the things, some of those awkward moments where they were done kind of on purpose it was tongue-in-cheek kind of making fun of this religion kind of i don't know i can't put my finger on what it was but some of it seemed like they were they were going out of their way to be funny we hope so, so anyway that it was on purpose <laughs> otherwise <laughs> otherwise it was the wrong turnout <laughs> i'm always a big fan of tubs heavy episodes because they're always like the most ridiculous storyline <laughs> So I do appreciate when there's a Tubbs heavy episode because they're always the most ridiculous, over the top, fun storylines. So I, I had a lot of fun with this episode, but as I mentioned at the very, very beginning, it's like it might be for all the wrong reasons. But I still I still really, really liked this episode. John, what are your final thoughts? I, I enjoyed it for the same reason you did, that it was just hilariously done. There was a lot to laugh about as far as just the goofiness of it i just the the thing that bothers me with it is that i get you want to do you want to touch on the haitian population in miami you want to talk it's like every show in the 80s and even now still does a voodoo episode it's like standard protocol what it just i mean if i'm doing miami's close enough to louisiana that if i'm doing a voodoo episode i'm doing a tubs and crockett leave go to louisiana mm -hmm. for something mm -hmm. kind of you know with the fan boats and you know that type of episode i guess if i'm doing mm -hmm. it like i said i get they want to adjust the haitians but they could be they could have just been haitian gangs i just they didn't talk about voodoo and they didn't know much about voodoo when they were when the episode was like going on it was just everything was voodoo like i don't think the voodoo aspect of the episode was even all that necess necessary or it could have been just written better i don't have done it in louisiana like new orleans or something there i don't know i guess that maybe that's i've watched too many voodoo episodes and for some reason they always take place in new orleans <laughs> that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode as you can tell we had a lot of fun not just watching this episode but discussing it so i i think this is a a classic this goes for me as a classic vice episode you can I do want more tubs accents we've gotten jamaican and french so i'm hoping to get german sometime before season three <laughs> 
We'd love to hear from you. Email the show, go with the heat at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, just at go with the heat. As I mentioned, we'd love to hear from you. So email us what your thoughts are on this episode or come back next week and email us after we find out from Melissa, one of her favorite episodes in Bushido. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.